You are listening to Squid and the Ultimate Leafs fan. Hello, Canada and hockey fans of the United States and Newfoundland. And an extra big hello to Canadian servicemen overseas. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Squid and the Ultimate Leafs fan. I'm Mike Wilson, the Ultimate Leafs fan, and joining me as usual, my ringer, Ricky Squid Vibe. We are recording a day earlier than usual this week because you're off to a special appearance with Hudik Natris uh, the next couple of days. So first off, fill us in, well, first off, let us know how you're doing. And secondly, let's let the listeners know what you're up to over the next few days. Well, Rick uh, does a lot of things with the indigenous people in, uh, across the country and, and different areas. And so we're going up to Cochrane. We're going to do some uh, things with young kids on the outdoor rink. We're going to run them through some some drills and teach them a few things. And in the meantime, we're going to meet, you know, the council and have dinner with them and play a little game the day after the clinics and have a little bit of fun. And, uh, but, but it's going to be a little chilly up there though. <laughs> well, yeah, but you got to be getting a little bit excited with the golf knocking on the door. Oh yeah. Yeah. I played the uh, Sunday, Monday, Sunday. I was horrible. Monday, yeah, Monday I was good. I was 76. Uh, but our course is going to open on January, I mean, April 2nd, which is not that far off. And I am, I can't wait. Here we go. So we'll be all set to go. Well, our guest today, Squid, after Russ Kona last week, uh, is in, well, on your, uh, you can, by the way, you can listen to that one still on all your favorite podcast networks. You can get it on, well, you'll eventually get it on Squid's uh, Ultimate, uh, his f- uh, website, but you get it on the Ultimate Leaf fan website, our new updated version. We've had two thirds of the hound line, so it's only fitting that we have the third member of that unit on with us today and Gary Lehman. Yeah. Well, why wouldn't we? I mean, you know, those are three guys that were all great players and they played together. They played, they all went to Notre Dame and they were put together as a line. Yep. And, uh, and it just worked out perfectly because Russ was a centerman, Gary was a right winger, and well, him and Wendell were defensemen first, but then Gary became a right winger and Wendell a left winger. Well, Adam, we'll see what he has to say about all of that, so we'll touch on that in a few minutes. But first off, our Mayo Maple believe split a pair last week. Um, the last we spoke, Jack Campbell had another strong outing. It's only his fourth start of the year, but he's undefeated. Speculation he's going to go again, and I think rightfully so. I would say the right thing to do would be to go back with him, uh, mainly because I just Freddie doesn't see doesn't look real confident right now. And uh, you know, I know playing all the years I played the goalies sometimes, you know, they're just they're different. They're they're different guys, and they play a different position, obviously, which is a very very pressure situation. And there's just times where they just, they're out of sync and they're out of, their mind is not, you know, going in the right direction and, and they struggle a little bit. And I think Freddie's going through that right now. So, I mean, if I was, I don't know, if I was coaching the team, that would be the guy that I would go with uh, as long as he's winning. Well, let's uh, listen. Uh, Lee has been a couple of years ago that a story on uh, it's the toughest positions to play in sport. And the number one position was goaltending in hockey. So it's come a long way since the days of the little chubby guys like uh, Gump Worsley, Matt playing in goal and the, the guy who can't skate. And again, let's face it, Jack Campbell, he's not some guy from my Duchess Beer League team in Markham. This guy is a former first round draft pick. He's played in the league a long time. He's had elite goaltending skilled coaches working with him. He's played at a high level. Same with Freddie. Freddie's got some injuries right right now that are lingering on him. So it looks like he may be out for a little bit, but he's going through a rough patch. It's the same as any forward or any defenseman in this day and age, especially this year. You go with the player that's playing the best. And if Jack's playing the best, play him. And my view is also, you know, put Hutch in there again, give him that a shot. And this finish goal they just acquired, let him play a game. Let's see where he, like maybe as we said last, maybe he's in the Cam Ward. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, you never know. I mean, uh, I mean, it's no different than a forward. I mean, if a, if, a, if a forward or a defenseman is, you know, has a couple of bad games and they don't play well, well, guess where they are? The the third game, they're they're sitting in the stands. They're not, they're not dressing. I mean, it, so it's no different with your goaltending. And I I know from experience what I coached for seven seven years uh, in the minors was you know whoever the hot goalie was was the guy that was going to be playing. And, uh, well, uh, American League was a little different because 
you know, they had a J.S. Jaguar and say John Calgary did at the time who they wanted to bring yeah. up and everything. So, you know, he was the guy that was going to play the most. And, and that's just kind of the way it goes. But, um, but hey, they're no different than any other player in the team. You're, you're playing bad. You don't play. Well, I like it. That's the way I look at it. Well, look at Vancouver's picked off another depth player from Toronto and Travis Boyd, who I thought the team should have given a better chance and used him a lot differently because I don't know, it's good. Maybe this is me, but I seem to be noticing this year, especially teams playing every other night, and you're only playing six other teams, that it's it's the easiest year to ever scout teams because they're all playing. You're playing every other night and you can watch them. So there's no no easier year for coaches to scout teams and you know who the players are. But in a year like this, I notice especially guys like Austin Matthews and all the star players now have bigger targets on their back. There's more hits from behind. There's more players being hit when they're in sort of an uncompromising position. Uh, there's a lot of slew footing going on. Uh, you could see last weekend against Calgary, the message from the coaching staff was clarity to just not let Matthews get comfortable, take a piece of him every chance you got. And you see Luchitz, as usual, cheap shot artist that he is, hits Matthews in a vulnerable position. I mean, Tom Wilson was at it again, you know, and all this other stuff that's going on, you know, uh, like Tachuk, you know, like his, who's now become almost the new Brad Marsh and it looks like in the league, you know, him and him and, you know, Muslim were having a great battle. It was great. Them two of them hit like that, but you know, the cheap shit where he goes into a corner, every time he goes to hit Muzzin, he's trying to punch him in the head, knowing he's wearing a full mask because he's got a face injury. I mean, that's slap shot junior hockey stuff. I, I mean, it's a time now are you seeing that maybe the players should be allowed to start placing themselves a little bit more and start like, let's put it this way. If that happened back in your and you were playing or even back in the Sittler era with Tiger Williams and Kurt Walker on the bench, would that have been going on? No, no, that wouldn't make, well, it, it might've happened, but it wouldn't happen very often. Because <laughs> the person who, the person who was committing it, would know that there's five guys sitting on that bench over there that are going to be coming after you if you if you pull off something like that. So I, I'd have to say, I mean, I, I don't know about them policing themselves. I think to a degree, I think it would probably help the game. The biggest thing I see, Mike, is that without the red line, guys are getting hit in, in, in bad positions because mm -hmm. the speed of the guys going through the neutral zone and getting in on the four check is so much better than it was, was in my day. I think if they put the red line back in, I think that would really help the game. It would slow the, the four check down a little bit and you wouldn't see those nasty hits like you're seeing now. And uh, I don't know that that's just my personal opinion. I would put it back in. It would also make the defenseman more accountable of, getting the puck out of their own zone safely, making good passes. The forwards wouldn't be up at the far blue line waiting for those home run passes. And maybe they'd be a little better defensively in their own zone. And I'm talking not one particular key. I'm talking about every key. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, that, 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 listen, that's, that's something I never thought of it from that angle. And that, that actually makes a lot of sense uh, because that along with the accountability that the players have to address and have to own up to, uh, this, you know, you, you just you just hate to see a 25 cent player like Lucci take out a million dollar asset. You know, I mean, here's a guy who yeah. for three years has been leaving the rink in Calgary and Edmonton and he has to disguise himself walking so he doesn't get arrested for stealing his paycheck. You know, but then he gets now an opportunity to hit a defenseless player. I mean, and this goes for all of them, too. I mean, you know, you got the McKinnons of the world, uh, you know, McDavid, Drysdale, all these guys are all vulnerable to this. So. I, you know, I'm just thinking, wouldn't Clark Kyle Clifford look good with Simmons and play with Johnny Tavares, who's been taking a pounding this year? And you're, that's one of your million-dollar assets, too, that's getting pounded into the ground. And, you know, those two guys playing with him, you'd have a little bit more room. You mean $11 million? Well, I meant the asset, you know what I mean? Like it's about $77 <laughs> million, actually. But, I, mean, yeah, I mean, I meant per, per, per year. But, yeah. but, you know what, you got to figure, too, that you know, when you're playing, you're not playing all the teams in the league. You're playing, like you mentioned, six teams all year long. That's my okay. point. I mean, the point is the coaches put a, put together a game plan. If you're playing Toronto, what are you saying? We we got to shut down Matthews, Marner, 
Tavares, we got to be hard on those guys. And, and I mean, that's just the way it is. And I, I, I'm sure it's no different on McDavid and Drysdale and those guys when every team plays against Edmonton. It's probably the very same thing. Shut those guys down, play them hard, and don't let them get going. Well, I, like, I have no problem with that. Like, a Hannafin's hit on Matthews in the corner when he stood him up and knocked him over, no problem with that. That He hit him right in the middle of his crest. It's the defenseless plays that our players are getting allowed to get away with. I mean, and even – I haven't seen it in our – so far, what we've been playing, but uh, the slew footing and all this that seems to be picking up and guys taking the cheap shots, all that – that's all the stuff I'm referring to. And, you know, at some point, you, that, that's got to yeah. end. I mean, you know what, either – I'm not really sure what the best way to approach it is, is do you go back and say, okay, take out the instigator and allow a guy to stick up for his teammate and, you know, let the guys police themselves, or you have to have a sit down with the referee, all the referees and say, listen, this is clearly a penalty because he hit the guy when he was in a vulnerable position. And if, if this happens, you need to call that. Mm -hmm. You know, and then perhaps if it's a real bad one, it's a five minute major, uh, which gives that that other team a five minute power play. And then the league has to step in and, and you know, start suspending guys as well for, for hits like that when penalties aren't called. Where I was going with it is I was to take out that instigator rule and allow these guys to defend themselves. Not stuff like where if you make a good body check and all of a sudden you got to fight three guys. I mean, that nonsense. So you're challenging guys so a guy can get in good with the coach. All that stuff, the stage fights, I don't want that. But stuff where you have, well, I just go back to Leaf game because those are the game we watch. And when all of a sudden when Simmons went after Taychuk, now that was the funniest part. And go back, people want to go back and look at the highlight of that when he did, had the boarding penalty about halfway through the third period on him and he planted him against the backboard. The look on Taychuk's face, he was not expecting that at all. And Simmons came out of nowhere and got him good. And that's one of those good yeah. penalties. And I'll tell you what, after that, he wasn't quite as brave running around hitting guys when Simmons was sitting on a bench eyeballing them. So now speaking of referees, the latest news breaking today with this uh, little hot mic situation with the Tim Peel, like how about all of that? Now I'll preface this by saying, I'll let you go next is that for years and my son emailed me today, Ryan, he said to me, you know, dad, you've been saying this for years. Cause we said, I'm sure many other people watch when you watch, can we, when I used to take the kids to games, you'd watch a penalty. They always say, if a Toronto got two in a row, says, well, they're going to get a power play next. You know it's coming. Mm -hmm. And I always say to guys, watch the box scores every morning and take a look at the penalties. And unless it's really stupid, they're usually pretty close. So what I did was today, just before we came on, let's look at last night's box scores. So I've got the Toronto sent up here. And let's just go through it very quickly. Uh, Nash the Nashville game, the one in question, Nashville and Detroit. Uh, the power plays were 0 and 3 for Detroit and 1 and 2 for Nashville. Okay, Flyers and Flyers and Devils. Uh, the Flyers were 1 and 3. New Jersey was 1 and 4. Uh, the Lightning one, they didn't have the box and they just had to run up, so I don't know what happened. But there was a 5 and 3 in the third period. But anyway, uh, Chicago and Florida. Um, Florida was 1 and 2. Chicago 1 and 3. On Monday night's games, the Jets and uh, Winnipeg. 0-1 Winnipeg, 0-1 Vancouver. Colorado and Coyotes. 0-3 uh, Colorado, 1-2 Arizona. And then you got uh, Las Vegas and St. Louis. Uh, Vegas and St. Louis. So we got, uh, what do we got here? 0-2, 2-3. And, and, and the only one that was out of whack was Los Angeles and San Jose. It was uh, LA was 0-5. So they had five penalties against 0-2 for San Jose. But every other penalty, every other game, the other seven games were all within one penalty. Well, I think, I think Mike, you could probably go back a long, long way yeah. in the National Hockey League and look at box scores and you would see the same thing. That's what I was, I was making. It, it, yeah, makeup calls, like it's like, okay, the, we just gave them two power plays in a row. We got to even it up. And I mean, <laughs> you can hear it on, on the broadcast. I mean, the referee saying, you know, basically he wanted to call it to even it up and he got fired. So, you know, it make, when I hear that and, and I watched it and I heard what he said, and I'm saying to myself, like all those years that I played, I wonder how many times in their head they were thinking the exact same thing. 
Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. You know, and, I mean, unless you go way back to, you know, the WHA and the 70s and the NHL when, you know, there was nights where there was brawls and everything else. And maybe there was a, a discrepancy of three or four minors from, yeah. uh, from one team to the other. But by and large, you look, like you say, you look at the box scores every night, and it's two, three, three, four, four, five. It's yeah. like usually one penalty difference. And you know? that's right. And and it's, and it's funny, the one that was uh, out of whack, the team lost that night. So it's almost like it was letting them back in the game, giving wow. them opportunities, but I'm not going to go that far with it. But regardless, hot mic. In this day and age with the gambling and all that kind of stuff going on, boy, oh, boy, hot topic. The NHL want to sweep this one out of the rock pretty quickly. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> oh, I would imagine they will. And, uh, you know, but I, again, it's just uh, it's the way it's been for many, many, many years. I don't think, you know, and I, I, I'm not sure consciously when they go out there, the referees, when they start the game, if that's what they're thinking. But I think as the game goes along, and somebody calls one and it might be a little bit of a chintzy call, then all of a sudden it's like, okay, we got to even it up. Like that was a bad call. Yeah. So they, they call it chintzy one against the other team. So I, I'm sure this has been going on for many, many years. Well, you know, now they're going to be in a close scrutiny by everybody going forward as a result of this from last night. So they're going to have to be on well, the best and, behavior. Yeah. And you know, the funny thing is, I've always wondered, like, you know, back in the days where, like, say, when the, when the Oilers were dominating everybody, and you look, at the, you look at the box score, and the Oilers might have five power plays, the other team had three or four. And I'm thinking, okay, hold on. They're playing against the worst team in the league. They're the best team in the league. And they only end up with one more power play than the, than the worst team in the league. How is that possible? I mean – you know, it's kind of like it shouldn't happen. Like the best team in the league playing the worst team in the league, they probably should get three or four more power plays than, than the other team, in my opinion. You would think. So we will we'll definitely monitor that one, Villa Colson. Folks out there, you listeners, just check your box scores every morning and take a look, and you'll see that they're usually fairly close if a lot of you aren't already, and I'm sure there's a lot of smart people out there picked up on this already. Well, Scobie, we come to that time where uh, this day in history, and this one I picked out for you, because you very speak very highly about this player all the time, but on this day, now we're doing this, 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 you're getting this dropped on Saturday, the 27th. So March 27th, 1983, Steve Larmer had two goals and an assist to set a Chicago team rookie record with his 41st goal of the season, the six, nothing win over Detroit. And he broke the record wow. set by Daryl Sutter, which was 40 goals. And Tony Esposito recorded 75th shutout. But I just wanted to point out Stevie Larmer on this day, Rookie record for the Hawks. I know a big. You're a big fan of his after I have been playing with him and an underrated yeah. player. And you you forgot one for today though. What's that? March twenty fourth, nineteen eighty two. Oh well, of course it was this week. Yes, 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 yes. I was going to mention that one. Go ahead. This was the yeah. This was your. Uh, uh, this was the third one, right? No, the first one. The first one. Sorry, first one. Your first one, 82. 82, yeah. sorry. Yeah. 82, correct. The 24th. I guess we should have said that. We could have used that one today. Also on this day. Although March it's 20th, not going to be on Saturday when it airs, but today. It is today. Today yeah. we could we could use today. So folks, for today when we're recording, <laughs> we're supposed to be doing this live on Saturday. Remember that's good. We're we're cheating here. <laughs> March 27th, 1993. This is what we want to hear. We want this one to repeat itself. History to repeat itself. Toronto beat the Oilers 6-2. And it gave Toronto a record of 40, 25, and 10, reaching the 90-point mark for the first time since 77, 78. So the Leafs are pretty much on that same sort of path towards points as we speak today. And they happen to play Edmonton tonight. So hopefully we get the same result we had back in 1993. So I think enough of all that, Squid. I think it's now time to go over and listen to see what Mr. Lehman has to say, and we'll talk about the Hounds and so on. Squid, our guest today, enjoyed close to a 20-year career as a pro, was taken 24th overall in 82 by the Toronto Maple Leafs as a defenseman, and became the second Maple Leaf to score 50 behind you, of course. Played on the popular Hound line, was a central part of one of the biggest trades in Leaf history, which we'll get into. Also played on a couple of World Junior teams for Canada, uh, won a Stanley Cup of Montreal. Please welcome Gary Lehman. Gary, how are we keeping? Ah, doing great. Doing great, guys. Thanks for having me on again. 
Great. Great to have you. And uh, how are you getting through COVID and all this time? And obviously it's impacting both you and Squid on the Legends hockey circuit. <laughs> I'm making up for it and on, on, uh, doing my daily walk. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, I, th I think you have to move around and and uh, you know just stay busy doing something because it's pretty monotonous and it's you know it gets I guess it gets hard on your mental health too if if you don't do that so uh, that's one of the one of the ways um, you know I, I try to stay uh, busy doing other things just you know little things and yep, you know, yep. chopping wood I, I chop lots of wood so. Squid, do you do that? No, are you kidding me? No, we, I go for a walk almost every day. Joyce and I will go for about an hour walk and play golf Sunday and Monday and uh, walk. And uh, so, like, I, like, again, like, and I do some projects around the house and stuff. And like I said, Gary, you got to keep yourself busy and, and keep your hands busy and so on, or, or you're going to go crazy. Yeah, that's for sure. No, I have watched a lot of, I have watched a lot of TV too. <laughs> yeah, there's some good series out there. It's good series. There sure is. Going through oh, yeah. like, like uh, hotcakes though. Lots of them. Yeah, yeah. good. Trying to find some new ones. I'm just watching Barry now for the first time. I like that one with the, uh, the assassins. That's, that's that, um, Heider, that Bill Hyder guy, Barry. It's on HBO or uh, one of the movie channels. So look it up. It's a two bits pretty good. So Gary, let's uh, go back to the early years and talk about playing. I'd like to just walk us through playing early years, played at Wexford. You ended up at Notre Dame, Saskatchewan, uh, and off to Regina Pats. Walk us through that whole period of your hockey life. Yeah, sure. Um, grew up in, uh, uh, born in East York, grew up in East York, North York, Scarborough. Um, by the time I got to uh, North York, uh, I was five years old that I was, uh, had been skating, <clears throat> I've been skating, um, in, uh, in, um, on an outdoor rink for a few years. My mom used to take me there all the time in, in East York. And, and then finally, when I got of age to play hockey, they enrolled me in, into house league at, uh, uh, the peanut Plaza, um, just North of Fairview mall and, uh, played my first year there, played for the, the Joseph jets, uh, Joseph was a, uh, and I I still believe they're around. I think they're still in the uh, Fairview Mall. They're um, a, a hair uh, stylist place, and uh, so um, from there I went to Wexford. Played my uh, major uh, right up to midget hockey. Played uh, for Wexford uh, on some some very good teams. We won the Timmy Tight tournament. The the uh, all um, Ontario. Um, uh, Pee Wees uh, won the Major Bantam uh, Loblaws Cup, and after uh, the Loblaws Cup, where I was uh, selected at that time as the MTHL Player of the Month uh, by the Globe and Mail, they put a picture in the newspaper with an article that obviously was a national paper, and the president of uh, Athel Murray College in Notre Dame, Martin Kenny, he um, he read the article and he saw that I wanted to continue my schooling and uh, like to play sports and all that stuff. So he reached out just so happened. My, my dad had the same name back, back in those days, you could call information, get the number. And um, I was away at a, a soccer tournament in Cincinnati. When I got back, my dad said, Martin Kenny called from Notre Dame. And I said, yeah, okay. So uh, he wants you to, he wants you to come there and, and play, uh, um, midget hockey and I'm like why would I want to go there Toronto's got the best hockey in Canada so it took a little bit of convincing glad I did it we had a a, a great run with uh, the, the first year I was there we won the uh, Canadian championship the Air Canada Cup uh, had some phenomenal teammates Gordy Kluzak James Patrick uh, Brian Kern just to name a few defensemen um, a couple guys yeah you, you may not have heard of Dale Durkach and Gord Flegel uh, were probably two of our best players that uh, never played in the NHL, but both were certainly good enough. They were just small. Mm -hmm. And then um, Lyndon Byers uh, and Dale Durkatch, myself, were a line my first year. Uh, and then um, my second year, when I went back uh, to Notre Dame, uh, I went back as a defenseman. I got a call in the summertime from the incoming new coach, 
uh, Terry O'Malley, uh, who uh, played under F uh, Father Bauer, yeah. uh, wanted to make me a defenseman. He said, uh, you know, we had lost uh, James Patrick and, and uh, Gord Kluzak and, and uh, Brian, Brian Kern. So he said, I'd like to make you a defenseman. You're going to be my captain and, and you're going to be the quarterback of the power play. And I said, sure, no problem. <laughs> Have a good summer, click. <laughs> uh, I didn't care, right? I was an athlete, just wanted to play. So, and he was a great coach. And the year before was Barry McKenzie. Two great coaches. Couldn't ask for better coaches at that time. Uh, and then um, I was select, because I was from Ontario, I was drafted by the Niagara, Niagara Falls Flyers. But I was also put on a protected list um, uh, for the Regina Pats because there was no, there wasn't a junior draft back then, so they had to put you on a list to protect you from other teams claiming you, yeah. and uh, then I had to make a decision of where I was going to play, and the reason I I could go out there is because I had to get a legal guardian, which I got, which uh, uh, the manager of the uh, midget hockey team was a guy by the name of Johnny Weiser, a great guy. Uh, so he, he and his wife um, um, basically adopted me. Um, you know, they were, they were my legal guardian while I was there. So that, that allowed me to play. So I was a bit of a trailblazer, a pioneer of going out there. Uh, Wexford didn't want to uh, give me my release. And uh, my mom went to John Gardner's door, knocked on the door and said, give me my kid's release. And he signed it right there and handed it to her. But uh, had she not done that, I don't know what would have happened. <laughs> so then, of course, they get, uh, I played for Regina and then got drafted uh, to the lease. Well, your draft year, that, what was lead us up to the, to the draft uh, ending up in Toronto? And did you, were teams kicking the tires as the season went along, your draft season? And we, did you do any interviews and take us through all that? Yeah, so my draft year was, was quite odd, uh, to tell you the truth. I, I, so, so I'll just uh, re uh, reiterate what I said about Notre Dame. My first year, I played forward. My second year, I played defense. So my two midget years, one was forward, one was defense. And I played uh, forward my whole career or my whole life before that. So um, when I went to Regina, one of the reasons I went there, one of the things they wanted to do is reunite that line that I played on my first year midget, Dale Durkach, Lyndon Byers, and myself. Mm -hmm. So I agreed to that. We, we uh, did the deal. I, I went to Regina halfway through the season. And this is my draft year. Garth Butcher was our top defenseman. He got called to the world juniors and we're on our way to a, a game in Brandon without Butch. And um, I get called to the front of the bus. Uh, Bill LaForge is our coach. And he said, he said, uh, didn't you play defense last year? I said, yeah. He says, can you play tonight? in Butch's spot. I said, sure, why not? So we, we play and I get three goals, two assists after the game he goes, you're a fucking defenseman. <laughs> so when Butch came back, we, uh, we played uh, defense together the rest of the year. I got drafted uh, by the Leafs as a defenseman. And then, uh, you know, then, then the, then the game started again. Like, what is he? Is he a defenseman? Are we going to play him as a D man? And so after some time sitting uh, sitting and watching uh, guys like Squid uh, in my in my spot, um, I, uh, I when John Brophy finally got there, he said, "I'm if I make you a defense." This was at training camp. If I make you a forward, can can you score me twenty goals? And I said, "If you play me, I will." So he put me he put me with uh, Russ and Wendell, and that was uh, I guess the beginning of the Hound line. So. Squid. Uh, yeah. There was, well, what, at what point, Gary, like, I know when you come in, you were, you know, you were young and everything, but you went to, what point or was there a moment or a, a period of time where you just sat down and you said to yourself, okay, I'm good enough to play in this league with these guys? Well, I, I tell the story about, um, so when I when I was at Notre Dame, I would come home for Christmas, and for my for my uh, present, my dad would take me to a Leaf game, 
And I remember we were sitting in the front row of Grace. And I remember watching the Leafs play. And I turned to my dad and I said, Dad, I'm going to play in the NHL. And he turned to me and he said, oh, yeah, why do you think that? And I pointed to Mike Pellick on the ice and I said, because if he can play, I can play. <laughs> so, so I, 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 I say this to Mike every time I see him. So um, anyhow, I, I knew I was going to play. It was just a matter of, and I, I know it sounds cocky and you have to do it. And I think the mentality helps when, when you believe you can. Um, when I went to my first training camp, uh, they paired me with Boreas Salming um, all through camp. He was, mm -hmm. he was my partner through camp. And I'm thinking, wow, this is, this is fantastic. And I'm, you know, I'm 18 years old. Yeah. And uh, uh, at the end of training camp, I had a great camp. I was just, I was just in such um, maybe better shape than most guys you know most guys showed up to get in shape back then I was in shape I was a guy that played multiple sports uh, every year and lacrosse soccer hockey and, and had uh, a, a phenomenal uh, VO2 um, capacity and so my conditioning was always good I was young I was fast and I had a phenomenal camp with with Boria but I was small. I was only 170 pounds. And uh, we had some other defensemen that they had just drafted um, years previous to me, Bob McGill, uh, Freddie Boymanstruck, uh, Jimmy Benning, uh, a bunch of guys that they had thrown into the fire and, and were, were sort of struggling. You know, Rick remembers that, you know, a, a bunch of young defensemen like all at once. And of course, Gary Nyland was, um, was my draft year he was the first uh, he was the third pick overall our first uh, first round choice and he was a he was a uh, you know a, he was in a man's body so he was he was able to to take the be able to take the grind in that uh of that long schedule but they weren't sure you know what my you know what to make of me so i got called in at the end of camp jerry mcnamara pulls me in his office and he goes i just want to tell you you were the best player in camp. And I'm thinking to myself, holy shit, I made the team. He goes, but we're going to send you back to junior. <laughs> and it made no sense to an 18 year old. I'm like, what the hell? I was like, was he just messing with my mind here? What's going on? Anyhow, um, I know, I knew I had a good camp, but it was the best thing for me to go back. I played the whole year as a defenseman and then won the, the Western hockey league top defenseman. I think I was like the third of four um, Leaf draft picks to win the top defenseman in the Western Hockey League, Jimmy Benning. Um, and then um, somebody after me, Cam, uh, Squid, maybe you can remember uh, Cam. Was it Cam? Um, Cam um, Russell? <clears throat> no, no. Uh, anyhow, uh, so we had four, uh, f four draft picks on Jimmy Benning. Uh, oh, my goodness. Two years before, but was Gary Nyland? Did Gary Nyland win it? Uh, uh, anyhow, I, I don't know. I, I have no idea. Yeah, so you got me so, there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I went back and, and played uh, defense the whole year. I played, um, you know, a, a big role on the team, and and uh, I ended up um, getting drafted as a defenseman by the Leafs. So. Uh, I didn't go to the draft though. Uh, good story. I broke my jaw in the the semi or the, the semifinals, and so I was all um, I was all wired up, and I was at the best of times like 172 pounds, and I'd lost 13 pounds. And my agent Rick Kern called me, you know, a couple weeks before the draft, and he said, "How you making out?" And I'm, "Oh, I'm okay. I can't open my mouth, right?" He goes, how's your weight? I said, I'm 159 pounds. He says, do not come to the draft. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there, there was, um, you know, I, I kind of had to steer clear of that. But it was, it was going to be between Lyndon Byers and myself, who was going to be the top leaf, uh, or sorry, top um, uh, Regina Path to be chosen. And then, so I'm, I'm at my billet's house uh, draft day, all wired up. 
And uh, Kevin Glant, the, the radio uh, announcer for the Regina Pats, came on and, and uh, announced that I was uh, selected by the Toronto Maple Leafs. And I wasn't surprised uh, because I saw Johnny Bauer, uh, Dickie Duff, Floyd Smith, Jerry McNamara at a lot of my games standing behind our goal uh, during warm-up where the Zamboni went in and out. They were... I could just feel their eyes on me the whole the whole uh, time I was in, in warmups, and I used to light our goalies up in warmups, and they'd be all pissed off. And I'm like, "Didn't you see who was behind you?" Because <laughs> by that time, I had been out west for three years, and I, I wanted to go home. Like I was, I left when I was 15, yeah. and you know, lose touch with your family and friends, and I wanted to go home. I didn't realize though how dis dysfunctional the Leafs were at that time. I, you know. I look back and I go, it would have been better had I gone somewhere else and then maybe full circle come to the Leafs later on. That probably would have been uh, way better for my career. But your attitude getting sent back to junior, you knew you made the team and they were sending you back for some more seasoning. So your attitude throughout the year must have been very positive and going into camp the next year, you're just probably lights out. Like as far as your mindset would be. Oh, absolutely. It gives you the confidence and, and um, like Rick asked the original question of, you know, when did you think that? Well, yeah. you know, at camp, you compare, obviously you compare yourself to, to others. And, yeah. and uh, I was blessed with, with, um, you know, having been paired with Boria and, and he was always a guy I looked up to when I, when I watched the lease before I ever ended up there and, and uh, you know, a great, a great role model, uh, both on and off the ice. <laughs> For different reasons, but uh, uh, he would. Bory was just, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an excellent teammate, uh, an excellent talent. You, you know, a humble guy that, uh, you know, uh, didn't didn't have to command the room or anything. He just got the respect that he deserved, and and he had obviously blazed a trail from uh, from Sweden for for the rest of the Swedes to succeed in the NHL. So, Scred, what did you think when you saw this? You mentioned, oh. no, you mentioned going back to junior. And I've said, I don't know how many times over the years, like, you imagine if they had to send guys like Gary yeah. Nyland, Benning, Boystruck, McGill, and they had have all gone back to junior for one or two years. Because the majority of them, you know, Gary Nyland physically was ready, but mentally was not ready to play in the National Hockey League. And the other guys weren't either. They weren't mentally or physically ready, except for Bobby McGill, I guess, was physically ready. But I always thought, like, wow, if we had to send those guys back for a couple more years, you know, we could have been a hell of a team. And, uh, you know, you're, you're uh, proof of that. They send you back after being the best player in training camp, and then, you know, the rest is history. Well, yeah, I remember I, that's, oh, Go ahead, Gary. No, uh, um, I was just going to say, you know, everybody's different situations are different um you know gary nyland uh was i i think gary was ready i i i i wasn't in favor uh of the role they put him in i think he could have uh, been uh, a more uh, successful um defenseman had they uh, you know not expected him to to fight uh, a lot all the time you know he's a He's a great guy. He's a fun-loving guy. He's a happy guy. He's a great teammate. Uh, he keeps uh, people loose. Um, I just think at that time there was there was so much, um, you know. I, I say dysfunction, and what I mean by that is the coach wasn't allowed to coach. The GM wasn't allowed to, you know, the, the GM wasn't allowed to hire the coach. You had the the, the owner doing both of those, hiring both of them, and then and, and then making them get along. One of them had the idea that, you know, he wanted the team to to grow. He wanted to, you know, have a nucleus of young players and and, and let them play. And the coach wanted immediate uh, immediate um, immediate success. And and of course, he's going to go with the veteran guys because that's just the way it was at the time. You needed veteran presence. You needed all that stuff. It wasn't a young man's game yet, like it is today. So, uh, so let's pick up on that. You guys, during your tenure of nine years, you played under seven coaches. And a lot of the guys we've had on the show, from everywhere from Boria to Ross to uh, all, Wendell to all the guys, they've all said the same thing that, you know, that team, 
felt that the, the, with the, the week, besides the obvious with weak management and ownership, one of the most glaring mistakes was not extending Dan Maloney. It's been said that he was finally finding himself not only as a coach, he was starting to sort of connect with the players, connect with the team. The needle was starting to move the right way. Then Brophy came in and set the team back, and he set it back years because he just had no patience with the young guys. And what are your thoughts? Well, I, I don't necessarily agree that it was weak management. I thought they did a really good job of drafting players. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's hard – it, it's hard to say that they're, they're, they were. It was a weak management team. Jerry McNamara, I thought, was a was a smart hockey guy, uh, and you know he was in a situation, the same situation Dan Maloney was in, where they had different philosophies, and like I said, one didn't hire the other, and mm-hmm. that made for, uh, you know, when it's when it's rocky at the top, it it flows downhill, and so the the I would say that the the, the players that were in favor of Dan Maloney getting a, uh, you know, not getting a fair shake and, and maybe were, were probably the older players because that's who he wanted to play. The younger guys, we, we were behind Je- Jerry McNamara wanting to, to grow the team mm-hmm. and, and, uh, and get a chance to play. Of course, you know, then you've got guys like Rick and Billy D and John Anderson and, and, and veteran guys that, they don't want to be in a rebuild their whole career. Right. So they, they would rather probably the older guys play, um, you know, have, a, you know, not have to, to, to uh, grow with the young defensemen that they had, you know, forced uh, into the lineup. So um, it, it was just, you know, it starts at the top. If there's no organization uh, at the top, then, you know, as a player, as a young player myself, when I came in, I looked to the Rick Vives and to the Borea Salmings and, and watched every, every move they made because I wanted to know, you know, I was green and wanted to know what was going on here. And, and, and you want to fit in and you want to be uh, part of a, you know, a winning team and stuff. Um, but it was, uh, you could tell the conflict. You could tell the, the, um, you know, between the manager and the coach. And uh, we saw it so, so many times. You say we had seven coaches. I thought I had eight or nine, to be honest. Um, and uh, so I had Mike Nickluck, um Dan Maloney, John Brophy, and then Brof, uh, Gary LaRivere took over from him. And I think Dickie Duff was in there. But it was Doug, well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm referring to Doug Carpenter and you, Tom Watt, Pat, Mar- all these guys were like, it's... Lloyd Smith, like, yeah. And George yeah. Armstrong, uh, yeah. you know, so there's a, there's a number of guys that were behind the bench. I mean, some for only a couple games, but yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, nobody really wanted it to be honest. Nobody wanted, I, I remember Scotty Bowman being in the stands when, when he wasn't, when he wasn't yeah. uh, coaching other teams, he was in Maple Leaf Gardens watching us play and Harold, we would watch Harold call him up. Because Harold used to, to sit up in the uh, the top of the greens there, and uh, and um, or the top of the the reds, and he would ask him to coach, and Scotty said, "Not without full autonomy, I'm not coaching your team." But he wanted to coach us. He saw that there was there was a lot of uh, promise there, but it was there was just never the uh, acceptance of uh, being able to. Um, control yourself squid yeah i remember seeing that quite a bit with scotty bowman but so dan maloney leaves and we're together that summer and i said did you hear who we hired (laughs) and you go no i haven't i said john brophy and he said who i said you don't know john brophy (laughs) and then so how did i introduce him to you oh yeah thanks on the spot here well if i'm gonna (laughs) If I'm going to be totally transparent, I'm I'm going to be um, politically incorrect, and I apologize uh, beforehand. But you don't so have to. It's yeah. Well, to get to get the 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 real uh, sense of what it was we were dealing with, Rick, um, he he had had John Brophy, I believe, in Indianapolis. Is that right? Right. Uh, Birmingham. Birmingham. Yeah. Oh, Birmingham. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah. So. 
so when, when Rick said, you don't know who John Brophy is, I said, no. Why? He says, oh, well, there's a story about him when he coached uh, Montreal's farm in Halifax. I said, oh, yeah. So I'm just thinking, you know, it's just another hockey story. Like, you know, he goes, well, there, there's these kids that sit in the wheelchairs and they sit behind the uh, – uh, where the Zamboni goes in and out behind the, the doors uh, and they're looking over the glass watching the game and there's one kid in particular who's kind of like the team mascot so Squid's telling me this story and I'm thinking okay you know where's where's this going anyhow um, I will say bro uh, away from the game great guy uh, you know un unbelievable stories all this stuff but anyhow, this kid was kind of like the team mascot. So I guess Brof uh, knew him and was friendly with him. But when the game's on, Brof's like, he's like a racehorse. Put the saddle on him. He's ready to fight, right? So they're in the playoffs. Squid's telling me they're in the playoffs. They lose the game 3-2. And this kid who's kind of like the team mascot decides he's going to wheel himself into the dress room. Now it's the playoffs and everybody's beat up in the playoffs. And the guys start walking in and they see the kid in the middle of the room in, the, in this chair. And they're like, hey, bud, you better get out of here because Rose's not going to want to see you in here. So the kid decided he's, I guess, going to leave, but he can't get out because the guys are walking in and he's in the chair. Right. So I guess Brof walks in and sees him in, in the in the middle of the room. <laughs> Squid tells me he grabs a chair and fires him out the door and yells, get the fuck out of here. We got enough cripples in here. <laughs> so um, that's the first story I heard of, of John and uh, uh, it, that story lived up to almost every single day uh, after meeting him in Toronto. There, there was something unbelievable that happened all the time. And my voice goes up because as you know, as, as, as we talk about John and as we try to describe him because we don't want his, his uh, legend to die because it was incredible. I mean, uh, his voice would get higher and higher and higher. Uh, the matter, the more angry he got and his face would go from, you know, from normal to pink, to red, to purple, to green. And uh, he'd be yelling at the top of his lungs. And, uh, but it was an epic one liner every time. Uh, and uh, he, give us an example. One of the good ones he got you. One he got you with, possibly. Well, the power play well, that time. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, there's a couple. There's a couple of real uh, doozies. I, I just have one. One quick one uh, uh, about Steve Thomas. Um, his first game in Toronto. Uh, we we weren't we weren't scoring, and. Uh, and, and Steve hadn't played with us yet. He was in St. Catharines, which is 40 miles from Saint, from, uh, from Toronto. And Brof comes into the dressing room after calling uh, Stumpy up. And after his first period, he didn't score. So Brof comes in the dressing room after the first period and he, and he walks around and he says, some of you guys haven't scored in months, months, months. Thomas, it's 40 miles to St. Catharines, but it's 4,000 back. <laughs> and then walks out of the room. So making him feel real welcome and, you know, the fact that he didn't score in his first first period. So there was stuff like that that happened uh, in between periods all the time. It's, well, it's I remember the, story. the best one that I, the best one that I can think of, a John Brophy story was in Birmingham. We were down after the first period. So he comes in. He goes around the entire room, every single guy, and has something to say. Negative, of course. So he's going around, comes to Paul Henderson. Well, I had never seen Brof lost for words ever in the whole year. But he just stood there, and he didn't know what to say. And then finally he said, Henny, Henny. Maybe you can talk to the big fella up there because we need it because these guys are brutal. <laughs> oh yeah, just stuff like that. He he like he came into the dressing room. Um, I think he was an assistant coach with Maloney at the time, and he I'm one of like maybe four guys in the dressing room. Vinny Danfus is sitting there half dressed, but the most 
uh, prepared dressed wise of any of the guys, other guys were probably stretching and, and, you know, getting sticks ready and all that stuff. And Vinny's sitting there, he's sitting back and he's got his feet crossed. The skates are on, his feet are crossed. And he sat right where the door, where Brof came in and Brof kind of stomped into the room. You knew he had nothing to do before the game. And because <laughs> Maloney wouldn't let him do anything. So uh, he comes stomping into the room and I'm one of, I, I, I see him and he goes, and Dan Foose is all chilled out, relaxed, you know, maybe he didn't look like he was, could have been meditating. He goes, he stomps in, he goes, Dan Foose, this isn't a fucking country club. He turns around and walks out. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> uh, just, he was bored. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. But, um, but it was, you have no idea how entertaining it was. Well, that's, I mean, that's, oh, yeah. now so let's just go back to that club you guys had. And I know that uh, Wendell Clark has had this conversation and Squid actually has brought it up to me. We've talked off air about this, about some of the clubs. And when you look, and I've said, I've watched some of the teams on Leafs TV and stuff. And I said, you know, you guys go back and look at the players you had. Like you're 80, they're just, I picked your 85, six squad. 86, okay. Well, I picked the 85 team. Okay. But I picked this team oh, here. Okay. I just picked these players. They're all on the same team the next year, but Jim Benning, Bob McGill, Ken Raggett, Todd Gill, Gary Nyland, you, Russ, Wendell. And then he had guys like Vet or Squid, uh, Billy D, John Anderson, Borea, Tom Fergus. I mean, look at that lineup. I mean, did you ever look back yourself, Gary? I know Squid now has actually looked back and thought, oh, my God, this team is a lot better than I thought. Maybe a little better direction, how good that team could have been. Oh, absolutely. There's there's no doubt. There's no doubt in our minds uh, – you know, it, it just always felt like there was uh, so much change. There was, you know, you, you bring a new coach in or a new GM. I had four GMs during that time. Everybody <laughs> has a different philosophy. Everybody has a different idea. So it changes. Like if it's above you, it's, you know, and there's no stability above you. It's just like in any industry. If you're a boss, if you have a new boss every year, things are going to change. And so that was, you know, that was the, that was the thing that, I mean, I think a blatant one was an example of myself. Um, you know, it, it took three years to make me a forward. Like, you know, I wanted to play D, but I guess that opportunity wasn't given to me. So I'm ready to do anything by at, at that time. Um, our teams were, our teams are very talented. You know, we had, um, you know, ended up uh, with Jeff Jackson and, and um, I'm just trying to think of other guys, uh, Dan Hodgson, a bunch of guys we drafted. Craig Muni would block a shot with his face, but they wouldn't give him a chance with us. Like it made no sense. He, he's the kind of guy I wouldn't want to play against because he's smart defensively. He's physical and he'll block shots. He, he makes it a, a difficult night for you. Mind you, he's good enough to play for the Edmonton Oilers and, and win three cups. Like, uh, it makes no sense. <laughs> That's right. So, stuff like that happened a lot. Um, um, and, you know, one of the other things, uh, I, I'm not sure if that was the time that we had both Kenny Reggett and Alan Bester, where mm -hmm. you put two 20 or 21 year old uh, defensemen against each other. And, I mean, talk about the two most opposite personalities on the team. You know, you put these guys in the, it's like putting them in a cage together, you know, for, like you put them up against each other. Where's the, you know, you didn't see the, the, the cohesiveness and, and, you know, them growing together. There was never the message of them growing together. It was the message of who's going to be the number one goalie. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know whether the philosophy worked I don't think it did. I don't. I, I would. I would have thought that a veteran goalie would have been uh, the play with one of those guys. Probably Reggie because he's bigger. Uh, you know who knows. But uh, had they done it, all started. Work, it all started at the top. That's what Yeah. No. No yeah. question. And, uh, no question. And and you know right. the the, neg the negative uh, light that's kind of spot. Uh, put on the 80s teams it's because the owner told the press to go fuck themselves all the time yeah and so yeah. so the way they got back at 
at him was through us some of the time. So we would get negative, you know, uh, and, and, and then it was also like there was a bit of a pack mentality with us where you'd want to, you'd want to come to the aid of either your owner, your GM, your coach, your play, your, your, your teammates. And so then you'd get pissed off. I remember telling a bunch of those assholes, you know, to bugger off, you know, and, and, uh, and, and it was just, it was the culture. It was the, it was the time. It was just the setup of, of the Maple Leafs at that time. There was a lot of talent and there were, there were really good players at that time. Now, how was your relationship with Ballard? Um, <laughs> well, Harold was a little older when I got there. I think I, I truly believe the de- dementia had set in mm-hmm. with him. Um, and I was okay with it. I, uh, he, he had King Clancy around him all the time and, and King was great. He was always super friendly and he would always come over to me and, and, and talk with me. And then of course, if, you know, if, if he likes you, he's going to probably tell Harold and, and stuff like that. My relationship was, was fine with Harold. I actually became the highest paid leaf. Um, I think uh, of all time when he was still there, uh, when, when I signed my last contract there. So, I, th- I think he was on my side. <laughs> he must have been. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, it was – it was. Oh, I think that – Sorry? Gary, on that note, I think uh, – that's very interesting because I, I, I don't remember any of the players ever having a problem with Harold. And I know when King Clancy was around, it was a lot better because he kept Harold in check. But I, I don't recall too many players that, that had a problem with Harold. Maybe when Punch came in, there was guys that had a problem with Punch. But I don't recall anybody having a problem with Harold, really, per se. Yeah, I, I, I don't either, uh, Rick. And I don't know, maybe you can speak to this. Um, uh, you know, being, being the captain, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a comfortable uh, uh, position t- to have – uh, before you so you know he, he had treated Davy Keon and and, um, and Daryl Sittler uh, with uh, not not very uh, welcoming uh, towards the end of their careers because they wanted more money and that became an issue and it seemed like to me anyhow you guys could comment on this it seemed to me like like he was making an example of the captains so that the rest of the players wouldn't ask for more money. So for, for yeah. you to end up uh, you know, with the C, I'm wondering whether Boria had ever had a chance to have the C and decided not, not to, because he didn't want no, to. He was that. asked what well, he was. eh? Yeah, okay. He was asked uh, once or twice, twice, and he turned it down both times. For and, that reason, uh, I think the main, and that's why that's why Harold loved him, I think, because uh, he wasn't the captain. So, do you think he was? He turned it down for that reason. Uh, he uh, actually told us it was partly language, partly the circus atmosphere, yeah. and dealing with the press every day, and he was not as comfortable with his language. But it, when Matt Sundin called him and said he'd been offered a captaincy, what should he do? He said the biggest mistake I ever made was turning down the captaincy of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Take it, and he said yeah. to us on this podcast that if he had to do it over again, he would have taken it. And he spoke highly of Rick as a captain and how he handled it all, especially with what everything that was going on at the time. Yeah, there, there were, there was some, uh, yeah, I was going to say there, there were some times, um, you know, the, the, some of the theatrics that were happening with, uh, with, uh, you know, Rick butting heads with Dan Maloney, a few of those stories, Rick, I hope you've told those stories. He has. Well, the, no, the one, the one I remember the stuff. most, the one I remember the most, Gary, is um, when he, uh, I forget what happened, but something happened. Oh, we had that argument in practice. We had it lost was- two games in a row, and he blamed our line for the two losses. So the next day of practice, he blows a whistle, calls everybody in, and says, okay, that's it, except Billy. Live Anderson and Padubny was coming back from an injury. He said, you guys stay on the ice. And then I go, well, what the hell is this all about? 
And he goes, okay, Vive and Anderson, you guys start skating this way. He said, don't stop until I tell you to. And I, I told him to fuck off. He yeah. started chasing me. And then I'm skating around. He's chasing me and yelling and screaming at me. And then Brof comes up to me. And he's my, you know, Brof and I got along very well. And Brof's going, squid, squid, come on, you know, settle down. and go, fuck you too, you old man. <laughs> anyway. I remember that. So the funny part about it, the next game <laughs> at home, he benches me. He, well, he benches the three of us. But then he starts playing John and Billy about halfway through the first. I sit there the entire game. And I remember how quiet the gardens could get. And I remember Danny went all the way on the bench wherever I sat, right behind me, the whole game. And some guy up above us, he said, hey, Rick, he said, you're not very busy. He said, can you go get me a hot dog? <laughs> and I wanted to turn around so bad and ask him what he wanted on it. But, but I figured if I did, <laughs> Danny was going to punch me in the back of the head. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that. That was hilarious. There was another time you had a uh, uh, an FU uh, fight with him. I think it was in uh, a, a morning skate in St. Louis. Do you remember what happened there? We you no, we were doing no. you were doing some down and backs. We were doing some down and backs, and and you got heated with with Satch, and it, it was. Uh, it was kind of like that. <laughs> remember? Yeah, I can't even remember that one, but yeah, it doesn't surprise me though. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, yeah, you had to, you had to do it. I mean, you know, I think that the guys felt like you were, you were standing up for, for the. I guess it was like we didn't really understand why, uh, you know, why people were getting chastised because we didn't have a we didn't have a goddamn system so we didn't know why you thought yeah. we weren't doing what we were supposed to be doing like we went out there and put an effort in right um and then you know if you did something wrong then you'd hear about it but you wouldn't be taught to do certain things you know we are, are like rick if you can yeah. please if you can please tell me yeah dump dump and chase like dump and that, chase. like you know and if you carry it in it if you ever swung back like the Red Army was doing at the time, like the whole league does now, you would have got benched. You would have got traded for doing something oh, like that. It was so absolutely. archaic. Well, now, you guys sit and laugh at some of the stuff now that was going on with this circus-like atmosphere. And we always ask players this all the time. Now, Gary, you coming from Toronto, you know sort of the esteem that Toronto is as a team is left in or, or is worshipped by fans and people in the city and so on and so forth. So now being a part of it, looking, uh, being on the inside rather than looking in on the outside, and you saw this circus-like atmosphere happening around you, and you, you must chuckle to yourself, if only the fans knew what was going on here, and this was supposed to be professional hockey. Yeah, there were, there were there were countless times like in between periods, shit shit that happened. You know, the, being a fan, you're sitting there going, "Geez, I wonder what they're getting." You know, I wonder what the coach is telling them now. One time we're sitting there and, and uh, we got, you know, we lost the period and we're sitting there and he sticks his head in the door and he, and he yells, "You guys are playing like you're in the fucking dark." Turns the light off, shuts the door, walks away. You can hear him walking away saying, "So sit in the fucking dark." Like, this is the stuff that happened in between periods, you know, like instead of saying, OK, guys, you know, we got to we got to do this. We got to stand them up at the blue and whatever it is, like give us some ammo so we can. And there was never a game plan. Ever. Oh, squid said that he'd come to practice the days and he couldn't get in the dressing room because Harold's getting taped or getting rubbed down by the trainers and the players have to wait. Yeah. yeah. Well, you'd have to wait. Yeah. yeah. But just like this, but all this nonsense. Well, Boya yeah. told us also that he'd come to the rink every day with his just his eyes wide open. Just what what's it going to be today? Because he'd all of a sudden yeah. see a little group, you know, huddling outside the dressing room. Uh oh, what it, what what's had just happened? And it'd be something, and they would just <laughs> expect the unexpected every day. Yeah, and that, that's that's yeah. no way to uh, that's no way to walk into your job. No, not at uh, all. And and me being from Toronto, and and you know, like I mentioned before, like I I did the a lot of winning growing up, you know, and, and I, I, that's what I want to do. I don't care about my personal stats. I want to win. 
that's the bottom line and that's the best feeling mm -hmm. like who gives a shit if you score you know uh five goals and you lose you know 10 five like it's it, it, it's not a good feeling um so being from toronto having you know known that the, the team uh, was struggling for years i wanted to be one of the guys to come in and help fix this but i lived my whole career in in toronto uh in change it's it was constant change it was constant and again when when i say change it was just a new person behind the bench that you wondered whether you were going to fit into their plans so everybody everybody's feet were firmly planted in midair <laughs> it was just <laughs> bullshit well, let's 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 take that one step further. Then, after 1991 comes along, and after eight or nine coaches or whatever, it's been talking to you guys all along. The team's in disarray. Your frustration meter must have been bouncing off the charts at the, by this point. The trade happens just after New Year's. You had a big now. People, I don't think, are aware of this. You told Squid this and I this story, but people aren't aware that you had a bigger hand in that trade than most people were, and maybe uh, you could. Uh, Let's share that with the listeners, how that all came unfolded. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, we had, we had hired Cliff Fletcher, um, took him from um, Calgary, where I don't know if you knew this or others know, but he still had a year left with, with the Calgary Flames. Mm. And at the end of the previous year, he had promised new contracts to um, – Rick, Wom uh, Rick Wamsley, uh, Dougie Gilmore, uh, uh, McCowan, Jimmy McCowan, and I'm not sure whether Natras uh, was uh, was uh, promised a new deal. He might have been. Anyhow, uh, Cliff was aware of um, of the players that that didn't end up getting um, their their new deal from from Calgary. So. What, the reason why he was allowed to talk, talk to Toronto was because management had, had, in Calgary had come to him and said, or ownership had come to him and said, Cliff, you can't, you can't re-sign these guys. And Cliff said, I'm a man of my word and I need to sign these guys. And they said, well, we lost money and we can't do it. So he's, that's when he asked for permission to speak to other teams. That's how he ended up with, in Toronto with a year left on his deal. Mm -hmm. uh, I found this all out through my agent afterwards. So, um, but I had no, I had also known that he was a fan of mine and I want, I, I had wanted out of Toronto before he got there. Uh, I used to call my agent, Rick and I had the same agent. Uh, I used to call him every week and I, I, I think we all used to call him and say, get me out of here. <laughs> and, and most of the time it was a joke, but it was because of so much turmoil and bullshit all the time. So what happened was when Cliff came to Toronto, he, he, asked me at the beginning of the year, he said, Gary, do you want to stay or do you want to go? And we've never, we never were had anybody that asked that question. If, if we said we wanted to go to LA, they'd send you to Quebec city, the furthest place away. That's what, that's, that's how uh, Harold treated the guy. He, he would spite, he would spite the guys. And uh, you know, who do you think you are dictating where you should go? Blah, blah, blah. I'm the bloody owner, whatever. Right. Um, but there was the crusty the old grandfather there that you liked about him, right? But that's just the way it was. But when, when Cliff came and he asked me, there was talk of the Grant Fear trade and uh, coming to Toronto. And that's when he asked me. Gretz, Gretzky had already left Edmonton. Uh, now Grant Fear is going to leave. I'm connected in the dots here going, I don't want to go to another rebuild. So I said to Cliff, I said, Cliff, as of right now, I want to stay. And he said, okay, no problem. They make the trade. They trade uh, Luke Richardson, Vinny Damfus, uh, Scotty Thornton, Peter Ng, and Freddie Charles, future considerations, and $100,000 for Grant Fuhr, Glenn Anderson, Craig Berube. Grant Fuhr's best days were behind him. Uh, same with Glenn Anderson. People don't realize what that trade did to the Toronto Maple Leaf organization. That trade, Vinny Danfus and Luke Richardson played 20 years 
Mm-hmm. Scotty Thornton played uh, 18 years. And uh, P- unfortunately, Peter only played one year. That's 59 years of service, okay? And most of those years, at least 50 of them, were left to be played by those guys that left, okay? The Toronto Maple Leafs, in return, got less than, what, eight years, seven years? Like you just you just don't you just don't recover from that crap. So they they threw all their eggs into one basket, and they were going older. They got rid of all the draft picks and all of their young uh, uh, prospects. And I I I called. Uh, so after it happened, um, I watched for a little while, and I watched the team uh, not, not really get any better and get berated by. Um, you know, Glenn Anderson every day. <laughs> and, and, and he thought he was going to come and it was going to be like that, like the Oilers dynasty. <clears throat> and uh, to his credit, you know, he wanted to win, obviously, you know, badly, but he didn't really understand what was going on in Toronto <clears throat> and how, you know, it, uh, deep rooted the, the, the issues were and how far the team uh, or how much change uh, the team had had uh, uh, had. So I called uh, Rick Kern. I said, Rick, get, uh, get me out of here. And we kinda, he kind of chuckled and I said, I'm serious. So he calls me back and he says, they don't want to trade you. And I said, who'd you talk to? And he goes, Bill. And that was Bill Waters. He and Bill Waters worked together in an agent, a Bernardo Sports. And I said, no. I said, call Cliff. And the horror in his voice, he's like, really? Like, that was the first time I was ever serious about it. And he called me back and he said, sit tight. He said, there's already something uh, uh, on the go. The, 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 the guys from Calgary were already coming and I wasn't involved in the trade. I was going to remain a Leaf. Had I known this, you know, looking back, I might have thought, hey, maybe I'll stay. Like, you know, maybe who knows, right? But I didn't know that. And uh, so apparently... Um, I got swapped out. Uh, Daniel Merwa was on his way out and I got swapped out for him. And I and, uh, ended up going to Calgary and he left not long after and went to the Islanders, I believe for Ken Baumgartner, if, if I'm correct on that. Anyhow. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've been traded twice and both times I asked. <laughs> well, I was going to say you end up in Calgary what was your, how did, uh, you obviously struggle a little bit in Calgary. Yeah. Were you sort of keeping an eye on what was happening at least? You, you wouldn't be human if you weren't. And you see all of a sudden some successes coming that I'd add pressure to you and just make things even worse because look, you're the key figure on that trade going the other way. And in fairness too, it's not your fault because Gilmore wanted out the other way coming back to Toronto out of Calgary, but and it had to have some impact because the fans and media and everywhere to be all over that. Yeah, I, I was really in no condition. Like, I was in no condition to, to play at that time. I, um, I had taken a, a McGinnis slap shot in 1988 to the back of my, my head to crack my skull and developed uh, some, you know, some personal issues, some, some um, depression and anxiety and, and um, panic attacks. And, and these things I was struggling with. My fitness level was, was excellent until um until that year so until night uh 89 so 90 ish it started to to really affect me and i'd been kind of uh living in silence with this um i reached out finally or one of my teammates actually reached out and uh and and uh and and helped me help me with it um uh and that was mark osborne uh and he, he recognized the change and I was really glad because it was finally somebody to, you know, to tell uh, something, you know, somebody, something that's going on with you. Then I seek some, uh, some medical help. Um, and by this time it was pretty, pretty far gone. Didn't really know how to deal with it. Um, my mind wasn't on hockey. It wasn't on hockey at that time. And uh, you could tell if you watch me play from one season to the next. And then, um, you know, 
going to Calgary was, um, it wasn't the best move for me. I, I, I actually went there and, and didn't play. Uh, I played on the fourth line with uh, Robert Reichel. Uh, didn't get a, a whole lot of ice time. And the team was already out of the playoffs. Uh, you know, they had made a, a, a big trade, some popular players leaving. And yeah, the pressure definitely was on, uh, but it was more than that pressure. I mean, I could, I could handle that pressure, but I couldn't handle uh, the other stuff that was going on with me. I didn't know how to deal with it. There was no, you know, there was no um, uh, uh, solution. Yeah, it's not like you know you break your leg. It's it's no. and it's it's really interesting because I I, I found um, and it was Ozzy that that told me about this book, and uh, I started talking about this with Rod Black on a on a alumni tour once, and and um, and it was about how you are uh, how you're supposed to float through this, and it, and it, and, it, and it allows you to heal uh, in, in a in a, in a way prescribed by a doctor uh, and it's all through the uh, a thought process so it was really uh, a tough time and then uh, for me uh, in Calgary you know the, like I said the team was you know already already out of the playoffs and we ended up missing the playoffs and then the next year uh, Doug Riseborough who was the coach general manager uh, decided he was going to bring in Dave King to be the head coach. <laughs> now, Dave King had, um, had selected me to the World Juniors one year, uh, but one of the things people didn't realize is I turned him down twice for the World Championships, uh, and I uh, and I really thought that was going to be an issue when they when they uh, hired him. And I called Rick Kern when it happened, my agent. I said, Rick, listen, uh, we might have a problem here. And he said, uh, well, let me make the call. So he, he called somebody. I think he called Al Coates or Al McNeil or both, whoever. And they're like, listen, we, you know, we want this trade to work out. We're going to make sure that Gary's uh, going to play a lot and all this stuff. And, you know, just make sure he's ready. I went to a camp in great shape. And uh, I think, you know, myself and Theron Fleury were the two best uh, players at camp that year. We had we had a great nucleus of players, Gary Roberts, Newendike, McGinnis, Suter, Vernon. Like, it was a really, really good squad, a really good bunch of guys. Uh, but now I've got the issue with Dave King, which rose its ugly head. And I ended up, uh, I ended up telling him to trade, to trade me. And when I said that, because he'd taken me out of the lineup when I played well and scored, and then, you know, he'd take me out of the lineup, we'd lose, and he wouldn't. He, he, you could just tell what was going on and you're the, you're the first one to know whether you're playing good or not. I, I was playing good. I was finally, I was getting my confidence back and, and a lot of things were starting to go well, except this donkey was in my way. So I said to Rick, I said, look, um, we, we've got a problem here. So he's, he, he then uh, spoke again to uh, Al McNeil and Al Coates and, and uh, they said, just tell them to, to sit tight and all this stuff. So I did. And then finally, I had a face-to-face -face in, a, in a fuck you fight with uh, King. And I said, just fucking trade me. And he said, nobody wants you. And that's, that's when I got serious. And I said, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to make this happen. I, and so I, I said to Rick, I said, Rick, listen, um, you better get me out of here. Because if you don't, I'm going to have to let you go. I had already spoken to Don Meehan. Who had who had um, we had struck up a friendship because uh, he wanted to get into the uh, racehorse business in Toronto. So he he reached out and asked uh, if I could hook him up because I had been involved for years. So uh, we ended up uh, buying a few horses together and you know started having a, a friendship and stuff like that. So I reached out because I trusted his opinion. He was a very powerful uh, agent and. Um, and I told him my situation and I said, um, I said, uh, what do you suggest? And uh, he said, well, let Ricky uh, try. And if he can't and you want to you want to uh, hire me, I'll, I'll take your I'll take you on. 
So I said, okay, listen, Rick, uh, we're going to be in uh, New York in a couple of weeks, play the Rangers in a couple of weeks. Um, I hope you have some good news for me by then, because if you don't, and you know, I don't want to do this because we've been, you know, together for 10 years, I, I'm going to have to let you go. So he's like, holy cow. Um, so um, we, uh, I show up in, in New York and we go out after the game and I'm hoping like hell he's got uh, good news. And he said, Gary, he says, I'm sorry, they, they said they're not going to trade you. <clears throat> and I said, well, Rick, I'm sorry. I, I have to let you go. And I, like, you know, it was pretty, it was pretty emotional for both of us. And, but, it, you know, it just became business. And I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to um, accept being in a, in a toxic situation with a coach. And um, I'll, I'll remove myself if, if um, you know, if that's the, if that's the case. And so I called uh, Don Meehan the next day and he says, okay, sit tight. He calls me the following day. He says, okay, where do you want to go? Minnesota, Philadelphia, Montreal, or Chicago? And I'm like, holy shit. I, I guess uh, King was off on his, uh, his guess. So uh, I said right away, I'd like to go to Chicago or I'd love to go to Chicago. And he goes, how come? I said, because I love playing there. It was so energetic and okay. it's really the only team oh, yeah. that I kind of knew at the time because, well, then I guess in Minnesota, but Minnesota was such a boring team and place and arena and all that. The excitement of Chicago, you know, I scored a lot of goals in Chicago and uh, I wanted to go there. And he goes, he, you know, when I told him why he goes, okay, he says, but I want you to seriously consider Montreal. And I said, really? And I didn't know much about them. He goes, I said, how come? And he goes, well, he goes, I'm like, this was Serge Savard, who's the GM. He goes, I represent Jacques Demers, the coach. And of those four teams, they got the best chance of winning the Stanley Cup this year. I said, really? So I knew as soon as he said that, I was going to choose, choose um, Montreal. And then, uh, so I said, okay, I'll call you back. I called him back an hour later to tell him that I want to go to Montreal, but that hour being a Toronto kid and drinking the Kool-Aid in Toronto, you know, and having to tell my family and friends, I'm going to be a hab. It was like, Holy shit. This is uh, what a feeling. It was really kind of a scary feeling, but uh, you know, after thinking about it, uh, it obviously it was the right choice. So how did that now talk about Montreal? Now you go from in fairness to you going into Calgary, you arrive after a major trade like that for some very popular players. That yeah. dressing room, it must have been just in shambles because everybody's looking around at everybody else thinking who's next or I'm gone or what's going to happen or where are we going here. So that obviously was not a good work environment. Different type city. You move to Montreal and every player we know that goes to Montreal just expounds the, the, the celebrity feeling that you get playing there start to meet with the way management treats you like all the veteran players reach out to make you feel welcome all the players make you feel welcome they pay the players well you travel well you stay in the best hotels everything about the thing is just first class did you get that right off the bat when you went there oh 100 yeah they they knew that treating the player as best as you can is going to get most out of them they understood that they had hockey people in those positions. They had um, obviously Sir Savard. Sir Savard is one of the greatest hockey uh, minds there was or is. And and, um, and then for me, having a guy like Jacques Demers behind the bench, he's a positive guy. I'd never seen that in my whole hockey career, professional hockey career. And for me, he was a breath of fresh air. I would have gone through a wall for him. And that's the situation that a player wants to be in. Um, they put me on the first line. I scored my, my uh, second game. Uh, I was a point of game player till the end when I, I hurt my ankle going into the uh, playoffs, two games before the playoffs. And, uh, and ended, up, ended up missing some games in the playoffs. Uh, but we had such, um, a, it was such a professional organization. I think, I, I love telling the story about um, how the Montreal Canadians respect you, even when they don't want you anymore. They treat you with respect. They give you the heads up. 
they gave me the heads up. Jacques Demers came to me and he said, look, we know you can still play. We, we, we've, you know, we've loved having you. There's young kids that are coming up and, and uh, you know, they were building the new rink, the Bell Center. They, that was all part of them getting rid of salaries. Their salary structure, or the salary uh, amounts were going down and down and down. They were getting rid of the more expensive players. The only guy that, that stayed off that team was Breezebaugh. So, and that was all to, um, you know, afford building a, a new rink. So they had su sufficed the fans with a Stanley Cup. So now you don't have to, you know, you don't have to repeat you know, it's fresh in the minds of the fans that, you know, they're not the last uh, organization to have not won a cup and all that, you know, the stuff that goes, you know, with what's happening in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it has to happen somewhere. Now it's, you know, it's on Toronto. So, but the Montreal Canadiens treated you with respect, even when they didn't want you. Now talk about playing in the city with the fans and the media. We heard a story told to us last week by your one of your hound players, that uh, uh, ex-wingers, that uh, he said that, uh, just to tell you how it is within Montreal, he told the story about Brian Haywood and Mick Jagger in the restaurant when Haywood was, have you heard this one? No, I haven't. He was in old Montreal having dinner with his wife. Mick right. Jagger's sitting at the table next to him. The chef comes and he's in. He's a backup. And and he's the backup. He's, he's the backup goalie. Right. The chef spots Hayward, comes running out. So Mick Jagger, I assume, is coming to him for an autograph, turns his back on Mick Jagger and asks Hayward for, <laughs> says for his autograph. <laughs> Runs back to the kitchen. So Jagger leans over to Hayward and says, excuse me, who are you? And he goes, well, my name's Brian Hayward. And well, what do you do? I play for the Montreal Canadiens. And this is my wife. And he said, listen, I've been all around the world everywhere this has never ever ever happened to be i'm buying you dinner and he did <laughs> that's awesome yeah anything, the fans, any, anything like sorry. that for you you can relate well you know just the, 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 those two those two places those you know i i know it's not respectful to say other places are are um you know on the same level and whatnot but as far as i'm concerned there's there's two places to play I was so, so fortunate to have played in both of them. You know, unfortunately, Toronto was a mess um, for, for, you know, the whole time, basically. Um, and, and Montreal was, was the polar opposite. It was, it's how things should be. So I saw how things shouldn't be and how things should be. And, uh, it, you know, when you see those, uh, the end of the spectrums, it's amazing how much, like when I watch teams play now, uh, how much I learned my 10th year, my 10th year in the NHL. I learned more of my 10th year than every other year combined. So, you know, it, it tells you how, how good and smart they are. They have a winning formula. They know how to win yeah. uh, and they know how to treat people. And that, that's a big part of uh, their culture. It's great. Anything, Ned? No, I, I mean, I, I remember Montreal uh, guys talking to guys that played there and, you know, even even other organizations like Philadelphia. Uh, I was talking to Dave Poulin one time when we were at their All-Star game and he was a captain of the Flyers and he said, he said so uh, the start of the year, you must sit down with the, the GM and the brass and go over your travel schedule and when you're going to leave and all. I said, are you kidding me? I said, he said, well, what do you mean? I, and I said, you mean you actually sit down and draw when you leave and when you stay overnight and everything? And he goes, oh, yeah. He says, I'm, I'm in on everything. And I go, not in Toronto. <laughs> no, not in Toronto. <laughs> so, so it's not just Montreal. There are some other organizations that, you know, but Montreal is probably sets the bar pretty damn high. Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, I could never see um, Mr. Uh, Brofman or, or, uh, or Ronald uh, Corey uh, or any of the uh, upper echelon uh, people uh, pissing on the front of uh, an airplane tire. Like, you know, this is stuff that we saw, Mike, um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Harold used to have to 
take a piss every couple minutes and he would for luck i think it was for luck would piss on the the front tire of the airplane as we're getting on the charter and you know yeah and we'd have to wait too <laughs> because he sat at the front and he he wanted to be on first so uh that, that's uh that was the kind of the deal um i i don't think that any other organization they're, they're no, people I don't think doing, so. doing that right so, so that 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 kind of I, explains you know a lot I, I hope nobody's offended by any of this because no, this, not at all. This is tr this is Toronto Maple Leaf lore. Like this is this is um, a heavily um, um, supported, uh, you know, great organization, and they should know the real stories, all of the stories, the real stories, uh, because they're they're Leaf fans. Well, if you, I, I do a lot of studying at the Toronto Maple Leafs and look at the history. And if you look back, and I've and I've had this conversation many times of how that team was run in the set, like when Con Smythe left the team and Stafford Smythe was gone. From then on, when Ballard took charge, it, it's just an absolute disaster. And it, it's just absolutely the, the bumbling and the bombastic way he was and the incompetence and all this stuff, everything else aside, it was run awful. And you look at the change today starting to top with strong management. It's no coincidence the team is better and you can see it. And how those teams, what they did, and you mentioned it, Gary, and, and, and Squid, the players you guys had in those clubs in the 80s, you had some good players. You drafted some good players. Like there was a solid foundation, but it was just so mishandled. It just was just awful. And the more people are hearing about all this, to your point, they're becoming more aware and they have more respect for actual went on back in those days. You don't hear people making fun as much anymore because when they're getting the real stories. So based on all of that, Oh, go ahead. You know, it's, you you know it's no, so the biggest thing for me, the biggest thing for me is that we drafted. Well, there was no direction. And I get that's probably the best way that I can put it. Mm -hmm. Like I know when I coach, uh, you know, you have to give these guys direction. You have to, there's somebody has to be in charge and say, this is what we're going to do. Here's where we want you to go, whatever, you know, all these little things. We had absolutely no direction the whole time I was there. I mean, we had no idea. It was just dump it in and go get it. And I mean, that unfortunately, that's what we had to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and well, and further, you know, and further to, to saying that, um, we we were, um, you know, it it sounds like sour grapes, um, and trust me, it's not because I put so much of my life into becoming a professional hockey player. I put everything into it, and to to have. Um, all that crap, unnecessary crap. Uh, it, it makes you feel like you've wasted your time. You know, I wanted to be a professional hockey cheated. player. Well, you want to be a professional hockey player, you have to put the time and effort in and you do it. Well, then you end up with an organization that is like, let's face it, it was a joke. We're the, 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 the Organization was the laughing was stock circus. of the league. It was a circus. It was a circus. It was a circus. Was, and uh, so, you know, for the fan or for the people listening, you know, if you think it's sour grapes, it's not. It, it's, it's think about putting all the time into having a professional career, trying to be the best, you know, that you can be, and then, and then you fall into uh, the dysfunction and and all the, you know you think these people know what they're doing, but it's clear that they didn't, you know, look what happened. Uh, so, so many changes and, and um, you know, it, it's really unfortunate, but you know, the, so I guess that's why some of the, a lot of the bro stories live because at least that made you laugh. You know, it was funny, funny stuff. There was a lot of heartache though. There was a lot of, you know, friends being traded and, and uh, you know, coaches being fired because the team, 
you know, isn't playing well, I guess, or whatever the, the reason is, but there was never, you know, never a plan, never an, a, a, a game plan and any organization. It was, it was just yeah. like Gloria said, you show up and what's going to happen today? Listen, we had Danny <laughs> Dayu and Tom Ferguson, and they, bo and they, they both told us coming from original six teams, Boston and Ferguson's case in Montreal and Danny's case, when they arrived in Toronto, they couldn't believe, and I hear you're coming to a hockey mega in Toronto, they couldn't believe how dysfunctional and just sort of the, not the lack of winning or the respect for winning or, the, you know, that, that will to win, but it was just sort of was losing and not saying it was accepted, but it was part of the game as far as the players are going. Like, as, as um, Fergus said, if they lose two in a row in Boston, Harry Sinden would be, be ready to rip, rip the building down. And in Toronto, they lost six in a row, but nobody said a word to him. And the players just carried on like nothing was happening. And he just thought, like, what no, is we were just we would just skate for four days in a row. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we had – and we even had um, uh, Gordy Stelic on. And he said – and here's, here's another story about uh, Ballard. He said the team is in a losing straight. They lost six or seven in a row. He's in the press box. They're losing five nothing or six nothing this night. And he always had this phone near him. And when it rang, it was battered, and he'd have to go running down to the box and do what he'd have to listen to what he'd have to say, and he'd yell at him and all this. So off the phone goes, get down here. And he gets down to the box. He goes in the little, you know, the enclave where he's sitting there at the end of in the bunker. And battered, and he thinks, boy, he's going to give it to me about the team. And he goes, what the fuck kind of music is that he's playing on that organ? Change that. <laughs> and he looked at him, what? We're losing yeah. six nothing, but yeah. that's the mentality. Yeah, yeah, there was yeah. in the mentality. Like, you know, one of the first things that I thought was really strange was when, you know, my first team picture. I'm thinking, oh man, this is like awesome. This kind, oh. this is kind of one of those things that, like, forever you're going to be in a Toronto Maple Leaf picture. So you've made it. You know, that's kind of. One of those times you go, wow, yeah, you've made it. Well, here, 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 you know, we are trying to fix our mullets and get ready for this team picture. And, and uh, we're waiting for, we're waiting for uh, what we think we're, we're waiting for Harold, right? Uh, he's an old man. So, you know, he's, he's going to take a little while to get down and stuff. So we, we were sitting on the bench for five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes goes by. It's like, where the, like somebody carry the guy down, put him in a, put him in a wheelchair or something get him down here well we were waiting for his fucking dog to get groomed to be in the picture with us like you work your whole life you're playing for the toronto maple Leafs. wow what a you know what a what a great thing but you got a dog in the picture with you and i often thought after all my team pictures doing? have a dog in like and i think to myself hey i, I am a dog lover I have a dog. I love my dog. But would I put him in a picture with and disrespect all these professionals that have put the time and effort into being, you know, some of the best players in the world? It makes no sense. And uh, that that no. just it just kind of uh, reflects on how he must have thought of us. Well, Gary, we want to thank yeah. you so much for being with us for so long. We just got a couple more minutes. We'll keep you in. Uh, we've got so much we could talk to you about. But just a couple of things here. Of all the coaches you did play for, you did play for quite a few. Who had the biggest impact on you, sort of from a life lesson perspective, in a positive way? Or maybe not? Um, in a, honestly, it, 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 I didn't feel like it was like that ever. I didn't feel like there was – I thought it was always – um, a professional situation that nobody really got close to coaches. Like if you, if you were close to a coach, you're kind of a brown noser. Yes. I don't know. You know, cause, cause they were, they, most teams were hiring hard ass people, you know, look at the guys we had. Um, look at, look at, you know, the, the, the coaches that were behind the bench in Minnesota and, in Chicago, the teams in our divisions that we, you know, we played against, mm -hmm. they were, they were all ex, you know, fighters and, and uh, just, you know, hard ass people. So 
I don't know what it was like for others. I never got really close to a co. I, I liked Brof because he had a, a shit ton of kids. It was hilarious. <laughs> and he wanted to win so bad. And I, I actually felt sorry for him a lot of the time. And I really wanted to, you know, um, I really wanted it to work out because I thought what he did, and not in every situation, but I thought what he did is, is he, he kind of, um, he kind of, he, he got rid of, uh, a lot of the guys he got rid of were guys that didn't want to win, that didn't care, and, and that you could kind of sense it. Everybody wants to win, but then you show it, whether you really do or, or you don't, you know? So, uh, you know, I kind of took to him because, you know, really the first personal thing he said was, hey, if I make you a forward, will you score me 20 goals? I'm thinking, oh, I got a commitment here. <laughs> yeah, sure. So that's, you know, and, and then of course, um, you know, when I went to Montreal, Jacques Demers was just a positive uh, impact. He was a positive guy. So it was a breath of fresh air. And there was, a, you know, there was always some, some, uh, some, you know, talk back and forth and some, you know, some chitter chatter and, and some good stuff, right? Well, what I, where I was going with it was more along the lines of players. <laughs> uh, the names that come up a lot are names like Pat Quinn, because the, and it's not so much as you getting to know the player personally, the coach personally, how he handles himself, how he addresses the team, how he deals with losing. Such it's easy to be a positive guy when you're winning. How teams, how they react when you're losing, when things aren't going well. You know how he speaks to you as a player, deals with the rest of the players as a team. Serge Savard's name comes up a lot the way just from the management side, how they handle players when they're trading them and move him. That's where I was kind of going for because, you know, some of these guys will have an impact on you at a time and maybe we're trying to straighten you out. And, you know, Squid, you can fill in on this too because you went through a lot yourself. The only, I mean, aside from growth, um, the only guy that really actually kind of got along with, Mike Nicolak was the only guy that took the time to call me into his office and would talk about other things other than hockey. You know, now maybe that's not a good thing. Maybe he should have been talking about hockey and, and what we were going to do in order to win. But but he was sitting down and he, he talked to you about life in general. And and, I, and it kind of made you feel like, okay, you know what, he, he actually cares about us, you know. And, and Mike was a very nice man. Um, you know, he just didn't change the culture or the way we played at all. And uh, so the same results. Well, no, but I mean, like a player like you, he called you in and he said, listen, you got to like oh, even yourself. When uh, when you spoke to Brophy and Brophy told you to stop, you don't or it was Nick Lock, you don't have to fight all the time. Would you rather have you on the ice scoring goals? You know, yeah. the way he handled you to get, get you on the right track to keep going as a player. It doesn't have to be your friend, but just directing you. No. No, he was good with me, and, uh, you know, I, I appreciate uh, how he treated me. Um, we still didn't win, but, you know, and, and, I mean, you know, that's what he, I mean, you played in order to win a Stanley Cup. Like, I remember growing up, we were never allowed to stay up past the first period. But at the end of the year, whenever the Stanley Cup was presented, Father would always wake us up to see the Stanley Cup given out. And that's one of the things I never forgot. So when I got finally got a chance to play in the National Hockey League, that was it. I, I just wanted to hold that Stanley Cup and I never even got a chance to get close to it. So, you know, I mean, uh, you look at everything that went on in Toronto and now we know why. Well, let me go with this, this way for you, Gary. Try this way. How about some of the players you played with over the years? There's two parts. There's one that the kind of unappreciated guy who was a good guy in the room, good guy in the ice that maybe doesn't get enough recognition. And some of the strong leaders you played with over the years, guys like Squid. Now, I have to mention him. He'll be pissed at me if I don't bring his <laughs> name up. But, you know, before, yeah. You know, he played with Guy Carboneau, Kurt Muller, Gary Roberts, Newen Dyke. Some of the characteristics these guys had to be strong leaders and some of the qualities that may have spun up with the players. Yeah, I, I uh, you know, I, I would say every guy that you mentioned there was uh, a leader uh, in in his own in his own right. Um, all great, um, all great guys. Uh, I can honestly say all great guys. All guys that you'd want on your team. Uh, guys that 
showed the example of showing up every day and working. And that was, you know, that was um, something that you didn't always see back then. You know, there, there were mm -hmm. like, you know, training camp was used to get in shape and, and then, um, you know, guys would take nights off and, and guys would take practices off and, and stuff like that. And um, every, every one of those guys you mentioned wasn't one of those guys. They, they were guys that showed up to work. They were sh guys that showed up, uh, you know, to, to um, hold up their, their end of the bargain. And um, I was going to, I was going to mention Mike Nicolak. I didn't have him long enough, but yeah. I remember him in the room being a kind of guy that would, would, would sort of settle, try to settle the room down and, and, and try to, you know, uh, you know, not, not rant and rave. He wasn't a, he wasn't a yeller or a screamer no. at all. And, uh, and a nice guy and, and, and was an, he was a, he was a personable guy. Um, but um, yeah, we, we, we didn't get a whole lot of that after Mike and, and, uh, so, uh, you know, the, the leaders, like, like, I think Rick was in a really tough spot because he, um, he, he had, he had to butt heads at some point with, with either management or coach or, or, uh, or the owner. And so everybody knew how sort of precarious the situation was based on history. Um, but he, he did a good job. He did, he did a really, really good job um, of showing up every night. Rick battled like nobody. I don't, I hope people don't forget how, you know, yeah. Okay. He scored 50 goals three times and, and whatnot, but he worked his can off and took a beating to do it and went to the tough areas and that tough area that was a tough area back yeah. then yeah. not like it not not now it's not so don't compare don't compare it you go there you know you're going to get whacked but you know you're going to get a chance so and gary um, wanted to use my stick <laughs> <laughs> yeah i couldn't pick it up those squid had the heaviest stick in the history of hockey that's why when he came down the wing he would let a shot go and once in a while he, he hit the goalie's pad. Most of the time he would just miss it on the, on the right side, but um, he would hit it and it would, there was this thud that went through the rink. It was the heaviest shot, but his stick, I could barely pick it up. So um, if you're looking for firewood, like I, I told you at the beginning, I chop firewood. You should just cut some of your sticks up. Throw them in. They're I just, just hang them up in the garage and do pull-ups. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gary, last question here. We'll let you go. Is uh, that we always try to get set of get the over the years, all the guys you play with, the funniest guy you play with, and the biggest prankster, and maybe one of the pranks you remember best. Oh man, there's so many funny guys. I don't know if you can. Builder Lego. Billy's got the. He's got oh. the greatest sense of humor of all the guys I played with. Dry funny uh, uh time, timing's just epic and his outlook and how like you, you i always he always sets me back like like how does he even think of that like i you wouldn't think to, to you know that anybody would go there um but he uh he's by far the uh, the most underappreciated guy on and off the ice uh great guy um and what was the second part of your question? Prank. The prankster, the, the best prankster. prankster, and maybe one of the uh, pranks. We had a few. We had a few guys. Oh, your fans should know um, the the prank that uh, uh, one or a couple of the guys pulled on uh, our our gracious host here, uh, Rick. Oh, Rick yeah. We we used to do the shoe checks, and. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, and Rick, poor Rick is sitting there and Rick always had the best suit and the nicest shoes. And the rest of us probably went to Le Chateau and, you know, had all that uh, stuff that we thought was all, and that's Russ Cordell's fault, by the way, uh, for taking us there. But um, so we're, I think it was Chicago, one of these places we're having our pregame meal and that's when somebody gets under the table with some ketchup or some sour cream and douses a guy's shoes. 
and there's a few guys in on it to let the guy in, right? Because there's eight guys at a table. It's a round table. So somebody has to get on the ground and crawl with ketchup or whatever to put it on. Well, one of the guys got, got squid. And was he pissed off because he had these nice new shoes and they were, I don't know, they were, what, 150 bucks back then, squid, something like that. And uh, yeah, so probably. he was pissed off. So what better time than to get him again? So we got him again. And he stood up and he said, you fucking asshole, whoever fucking did that. He said, I don't, I don't have cheap fucking suits and, and shoes like you guys do. <laughs> he was so pissed off. It was so funny. But anyhow. Hey, he's never told us that one, Garrett. That's uh, he kept no, that one. Kind no, of he's, he's, no, we're 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 gonna keep him honest here. He was a great teammate and a great guy and a great captain, and and uh, we were sorry to see him traded. He was, uh, you know, he took a beating for for the team, and uh, you know, the team was was you know under with him. Uh, at, at least uh, we were watching um, a good example. Uh, of of how to play in the league, how to be you know how to be tough and, and go to the tough areas and and succeed. Well, you mentioned Billy Durlego, so we'll tell you the one story he told us when he was on about um, uh, John Brophy and his. Oh, so I mean, first off, when, when Brophy introduced himself to him and he talked about his coaching record, uh, he said, "You haven't coached in this league. You're, that minor leagues doesn't count. If, <laughs> you've got you haven't got a win here yet. What are you talking about, or something?" That and yeah. it pissed him right off to begin with. This is five hundred pro wins. That's what it was. Billy said. Yeah. He said, what do you mean? He said, you haven't won any. He said, he's coaching. What the hell is that stuff, pro hockey? So he got. The best one with Billy Durlego, with Brof, Billy was coming back from an injury. So (laughs) Brof was making him ride the bike and go up and down the escalator at the gardens. So he told him, he said, go in and ride the bike. So Billy goes in, he lights up a smoke. He's got a coffee in the other hand. And he's sitting there and Brof walks in. And Brof goes, well, if you're not going to work, he said, you may as well go home. Billy goes, okay, you'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> he got off and walked out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Get a coffee and a smoke going. So that's Billy D. Well, I'll, Gary, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one, one really uh, quick uh, story that I had with uh, a little dust up with Brof. And Perfect. I was playing the left point, the power play, and Wendell, Wendell was on the, on the uh, right wing, off, uh, off wing, half boards. I had the puck, I'm coming across and he's open. And then all of a sudden he makes a bust for the net and I'm going to try and hit him on the go. And then he puts the brakes on. So the guy that was covering backed off. So I fired it to him, but when I fired it to him, he went again. So I think he was just trying to get rid of the guy. So the puck goes into the corner corner. We're at Maple Leaf gardens and it's dead quiet. And I hear bro yelling from the bench, Lehman, wake the fuck up. <laughs> I turn around, I couldn't believe my ears. Everybody must have heard it. I turn around and I'm so pissed. I go, shut the fuck up. And I'm thinking, oh my God, did I just do that? So anyhow, I come off and we, uh, this is the best part. I, I, I sit on that stool and there's people like I can touch their knees behind me, right? In the golds, the first row golds. Cause there was no glass or anything there. So I know, I know that I'm, I'm in shit. Right. <clears throat> but he embarrassed the shit out of me. So fuck him. Anyhow. So I'm sitting there on this stool and I can feel him coming down and he goes, Hey, and I don't look, he gets closer and he goes, Hey, so I turn and look. And honestly, his eyes were swelled up and he goes, don't ever tell me to fuck off on TV again. And all these people started chuckling right here. They heard all this. So I'm thinking, oh my God, like, what have I done, right? So after the game, he calls me in into his office and he's got this little desk, okay? It's like, I, I'm thinking it's like three feet, three feet wide maybe. And he's actually pacing behind it like maybe one step, you know, pacing back and forth. And I come in the room and I'm, and I, and I'm pissed. And, he, and, and he's, he looks at me and his head starts bopping and his face starts turning shades. 
And he goes, there's nothing after fuck off. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> that was it. So I just turned around and walked out. Actually, I said, take, take me off your power. I said, take me off your fucking power. No, no, no. He goes, no, no, no. He says, but, but there's nothing after fuck off. And then that was it. That was the end of our conversation. So if you told him to fuck off, your friendship was done. It was over. That's, that was the message. I thought, you know, I'm going to hear something other than that. So. <laughs> well, Squid, any final comments before we let Gary go? Oh, boy. I don't know. I mean, we could sit here for hours. Absolutely. And talk about growth. I mean, there's no yeah. question, but, you know, the guy was a, you know what, John Brophy wanted to win badly. And I think if John Brophy had to come in as a coach 15 years earlier than when he did, I think he would have been successful because the league was kind of his type of league. And, you know, oh, yeah. but he did. He came in when video and everything else were coming into play and he just wasn't that kind of coach. Could you imagine you coaching know, those Leaf teams during playing the Flyers in the playoffs those years with Schultz? And oh, Williams and oh. <laughs> wow. And the Leafs teams were tough then. They were yeah. tough teams. Yeah. Oh, but, you know, yeah. let, let me let me just say one thing. You know, we, we talk about John and we talk about his demeanor, uh, you know, around the rink. Seriously, he would be the first guy I'd want to sit down and have a beer with away from the game. His stories are legendary. He is engaging. He is not a crazy man. Like he doesn't feel like he needs to win or anything. His stories are unbelievable. And, uh, you know, he was, he was coached by Eddie Shore and, you know, some, you can just imagine what he saw and what he learned from, you know, guy, guys like that. So, yeah. you know, he, he spilt it over into the, into the eighties, uh, you know, from like Scoot was saying, you know, if he was, if he was in the league earlier, he might've had uh, more success. Well, that's great. Well, listen, Gary, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. It was uh, fantastic and lightning as always. Good to see your face this time. Last time we were blocked out for the whole time we spoke to you, but good to have you on. Uh, we'll talk to you again thank soon. You. And thanks for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on guys. And, and the sun is still up. That's, that's probably why. Yeah, it's, no, still, it's, it's unbelievable. Still, yeah. I got dark on me here. I, I got to put a light on behind me. Yeah. Well, Call thanks. Guys. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. All right, boys. Take care. Yeah. Well, Squid, Gary, one of those guys you could talk to forever. I mean, just he's uh, very honest, open, direct, uh, very transparent, and uh, and you could just see he was a guy very focused and great teammate. Well, he was he was a great teammate. He was a good player. He was, and he said he he was one of the guys that was in really good shape when he came to camp every year, and he was fast. He could. But he, his hands were unbelievable, the things that he could do with the puck. And uh, a great teammate, great great person and a great teammate. Yeah, great guy. And I do remember his first couple of years coming in, his first camp, and he did stand out. And he was one of the best Leafs and yeah. everybody. But definitely that uh, year he did make an impact. So uh, always great having him on. We've had the Hound line on. So now we've got them all and lots of great stories. Uh, so, guys, yeah. once again, uh, we went a little longer than we expected that we normally do today. But again, we got a guy like Gary Almer, gonna let him go. So we want to thank you guys for listening. Tune in to us on iTunes or any of your favorite podcasts. Squid will have his website up and running pretty soon. Hopefully all our podcasts will be on your website. They better be. Get Matt to do that. Yeah, we'll, we'll get him on there. Yeah, tune in to the, our updated website, The Ultimate Leaf Fan. Debbie's done a lot of work on that. All the podcasts are on there. Lots of great videos, photos of all our events, and a lot of the people that have been there. Tune in. Let us know what you think. We're going to have Craig Meany on with us next week. Looking forward to speaking to him. Stanley Cup winner, ex-Maple Leaf, and another good one that got away from us. So, guys, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you guys all next week.